Hi, so we're moving on through the FSL pipeline and we're taking a little pause to go through some of the options that can be set in the level one feed GUI, which we've set up recently. This is the second video in the series. The last one talked about keeping your directories clean because of the practice FSL has of uh, not overwriting a directory, but it creates a new feed directory with a plus symbol. Anyhow, the, the topics I'm focusing on in this very short video will be slice timing correction and motion correction. Because you may have noticed, I mentioned I did not, I don't use slice timing correction typically. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, so I'm going to explain it to you so you can make an educated decision. So here's the general fMRI processing stream. Of course, not all of these steps are necessary. All of these are, though. All the quality control steps are. So you reconstruct your image data, and then you can do distortion correction, or you can skip it and go right to motion correction. So motion correction, you actually can't skip. Slice timing correction, though, you could do, or you could skip that and go right to spatial smoothing. Or um, sometimes people even skip uh, spatial smoothing. It really depends on what you're doing. But for, for a standard task fMRI, you're going to be spatially smoothing. And then last, you run your statistical analysis. So the slice timing correction is what I want to focus on here, because that's the first. Actually, I skipped two things. I skipped the distortion correction, and I explained that in the other video. I only go back and do this now if my registration failed. And I will talk about the BBR registration. And once you see how that works, you'll understand why it might fail if you have distortion in the data. Um, again, motion correction we must do, but slice timing correction, we can, I often just skip this step. So what, why do we do slice timing correction when we do do it? Well, the slices aren't imaged simultaneously. During our two second TR, the data are actually acquired um, slice by slice, and you can collect the data from top to bottom, but most frequently the slices are interleaved. The even slices are collected, and then the odd slices are connect collected. So here's a little cartoon of how that might look. Obviously these slices are thicker than the actual slices, but you get the idea. So this is the first slice collected. So these are numbered one through eight, but the order they're collected is one at zero seconds, three at 0.25 seconds, and then five, and then seven, and then we go back to the bottom to collect two, four, six, and eight. So between these two slices, or between any two slices, there's a one second gap. Obviously when we set up our model, our GLM, the model's assuming, assumed to be the same for all the slices. So what are we gonna do? there's a one second difference here. There could be up to a two second difference, right? Between this slice and this top slice. There's well, 1.75 seconds, but two second difference. So the idea is to fix this um, so that our model fits the data correctly. So instead of fixing the model, we're going to fix the data. That's at least one approach. So um, now if something happens at three seconds, when will we see it in slice one? We'll see it uh, ignoring the hemodynamic delay. We'll see that at, say, three seconds. But then in slice two, we'll see it um, in, at four seconds. So let's, let's explain. I'm sorry. We'll see it sooner. This will make sense in a second. So slice one is here in blue. This is the time course for slice one. Slice two is here. So just comparing slice two to slice one, it's one second later, but the time, so the peak actually looks like it's one second sooner, if that makes sense. And that's because we're, we're not adjusting the time here to the time that the data were actually collected. This is just the, the time of the TR. So, and then slice eight, which is much later, the peak is even earlier. So why would a model fit all of these well? And so we're gonna try to fix that. Um, just a little thought, would uh, slice timing problems be worse with an event-related design or a blocked design? Event-related, I'm just talking quick stimuli uh, with uh, fixation between the stimuli. Blocked, I mean continuous stimuli with no fixation between the stimuli. And it will be worse for an event-related design where the trials are isolated because you're trying to fit your model to a relatively short um, occurring thing. 
So the way slice timing correction works is to fix the slice timing issues so that the assumption that the data were collected at the same time is more closely met. And this is done via interpolation. Importantly, you have to know the exact timing of the acquisition, and I mentioned that when setting up the GUI to make sure you, you select the right option. So here's an example, um, slice two, so it's one second away. So um, we have to shift it one second forward because remember the peak was showing up earlier than it should because the data are actually collected later. So to match when the, the um, match things up, we're gonna scoot it forward a second. So this dotted line is the, the, sh the shifted one. The solid is the original. So now the problem is I've shifted this up a second. So my data no longer lie on the TR, which is every two seconds. So what you do is you interpolate. So these stars are showing where the interpolation, interpolated values are, and then you connect those dots. And this is now your repaired time course, or this is the idea behind it. So now all of the peaks, if you do this for all the slices, all of the peaks will occur at the same point in time. And so the model, will fit all slices equally well. One of the issues with slice timing corrections is that a um, bad scan gets spread out to other time points. So here we have a fictitious block design with an outlier. So there's a little spike in the data right here. Now if I use interpolation, I'm now going to have two outliers because this point is used to, to interpolate the data both before it and after it. So slice timing correction, again, in my experience, it hasn't been used much. Um, if your TR is less than two seconds, and if you have an interleaved acquisition, and if you spatially smooth your data, all of these things reduce the slice timing effects. Um, so kind of it, it comes out in the wash. And the, the group I know who accidentally had the wrong slice timing parameters when they fixed it, none of their results changed. So it kind of makes you wonder if it was doing anything in the first place, if doing it wrong didn't hurt anything. Um, adding temporal derivatives also will help uh, with these issues where things are off by, you know, something less than a TR. All right, so that's it for um, slice timing correction. I'm now gonna talk about motion correction, which is not something that can be skipped. So this is run using the McFlirt algorithm. I used to run it before my feet analysis, but now I run it within the feet analysis. And that's because previously, I didn't have an option to um, add the extended motion parameters. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is also called realignment. You align each image in a time series with a reference image. So this is referring to the raw bold time series. I'm not talking about registering things to MNI space. That's later. And actually, even though those parameters are estimated in the level one model, everything about the level one analysis is done in the scanner space. Okay, anyway, back to motion correction. It uses a rigid body motion correction which means you're using a six parameter affine um, image transformation. So only uh, rotations and translations and X, Y, and Z are possible. This type of motion correction obviously can't fix something like a bright slice in the data. Or, uh, you know, with the, usually when you have motion artifact with the interleaved acquisition, you'll get a bright slice. And this obviously won't fit that, fix that. It won't fix if the whole image is corrupt for a TR and is really bright but the idea is to fix the motion. So here's an example of what it does. So here's a little time series with five TRs of data, the original time series. And so this time point here is co-registered to this middle time point. And then you get a um, transformation matrix. That's what this is illustrating, the six parameter uh, transformation matrix. I know it looks like nine, but it's really six. And then the original image is registered and resliced, and then that's put here. So that's what motion correction is. If you have 252 TRs in your time course, I don't know where I got that number from, you're gonna run 251 uh, image registrations, registering to the middle time point. So the motion parameters can then be used to illustrate the motion. And we've actually already looked at this a little bit through the format of the FD. The frame-wise displacement metric uses these. 
So the translations and rotations, here are some examples of them. So we have the translations in millimeters on the left. What? Oh yeah, and um, not rotation. So these are just the translations before motion correction and after motion correction. You should never run motion correction more than once. This was just done in our book for illustrative purposes. The reason you don't run it more than once is it starts um, kind of trying to fit to the signal in the data and you can remove your signal. But here you can see the X translation is nice and slow. I never worry about these big drifty things because that's to be expected and it doesn't have a lot of impact on the image. I worry more if there's a big spike and this one doesn't have any. You might be wondering why these all dip down and they actually go through zero in the middle. Think about that. Anyone know why? Not that you can answer in a way that I can hear, but the reason these are all going through zero around here is because this is the middle TR that was used as the reference. So obviously the reference doesn't need to be registered. Also, importantly, the image is close to it in time, either just before it or just after it, don't need to be moved much to match up with it. It's the ones that are further away in time that need to be moved more to match up with it. Um, yeah, and I'll get back to that in a moment. I have a point to make about that. And this is just showing the after motion correction. It, it did a good job. There's not much left in the data. Um, here's relative displacement in millimeters. This is that first derivative that I was talking about that you add. And this is often way more um, informative in terms of things that are going to disturb your data. And that's if you moved a lot from one TR to the next. So you can see that the max for this data set's around, I don't know, two and a half or three millimeters. And you can see that that has diminished a lot after registration. This is after registration on the right. This is before registration on the left. And I wouldn't worry here if you saw any big jumps because the FD that we computed earlier, if you're putting the confounds in from that, that will take care of it. So what should the target image be? Just because FSL uses the middle image doesn't mean it's the best. But the, one of the reasons it's nice to use the middle image is because it's closer to other images than if you chose the first image. Because back here, remember I said, notice the images just before it and just after it don't have to be moved a lot. It's ones that are really far away. Well, if I choose my reference in the middle, then there are more data points that are similar to it. If I choose it at the beginning, you're only going to have this first chunk that'll be more similar to it. Oh, you could use the mean image. It's just that it requires calculating a mean image and why have the extra step. And plus it can be a little more blurry. Oh, and back, the other reason you use the middle image instead of the first is because the, the scanner warm up, you can have artifact in the first images. I still, like I said, I like to chop those off as soon as possible. So those should actually already be gone in your data. And this is just an illustration of warm up artifact. Here's time point one, time point two, and time point three. And it starts to even out. And you can see how this is every other slice. That is it. So hopefully that answers your questions about slice timing correction and what that option was when we selected motion correction. Um, and again, slice timing correction, it's up to you. Motion correction, not up to you. You have to do it. Laying down the law. So please join the Facebook group or follow on Tumblr or Twitter or all three, and more importantly, have a good day. Thank you.